Manu, thank you very much for coming um, in uh, this evening and, and, and joining in with this exhibition and to, to help us develop wider discussions and narratives around the, the artworks. And I, I think I want to start off by pitching it at that very wide level to, to ask you, we all know something about Tipu Sultan, about his father, Heda Ali, um, and about the regime that they uh, ruled for a while um, in, around Mysore. But you've written so much about uh, the history of South India, a variety of different periods, up, up to the Deccan and down as far as Kerala. Try and locate the Mysore of Haider Ali and Tipu Sultan, if you will, on this kind of wider historical map of, of South India that had seen dynasties that lasted so much longer, but also many others that, that like theirs, was comparatively short-lived in the early colonial period. So how does it fit into a characteristically South Indian pattern and, and what does it what does it mean to us now the legacy of, of, of their time well to begin with in the 18th century most of the states were sort of the shifting entities they didn't have fixed boundaries they didn't have fixed dynasties uh, you know people taking over the throne people taking over power was a very routine affair in a lot of Indian contexts and political uh, spaces and Mysore was similar in that case. You know, people often say that Hyder Ali usurped the power of the Wadiyar uh, royal family. But in reality, they had already been turned into ceremonial figureheads by their own Hindu Dalavoys, or the, or the local ministers, who were from a prominent family. They were kingmakers in a sense. And the royal family had lost a lot of its vitality. So by the time Hyder Ali came, he didn't really topple the Wadiyar king. He toppled the Dalavoy and took over a similar sort of position as, let's say, region to the kingdom and never claimed to be king. And this sort of pattern existed in a lot of places. There were succession disputes. There were people who were born of lesser mothers, you know, illegitimate heirs. In Tanjaur, for example, there was a Maratha prince who was, wasn't actually legitimate, but he ended up on the throne. Uh, in, in, the, in the Deccan Sultanates, for example, you have similar patterns. There's also this whole idea of you know, kingdom being, kingdoms being usurped as a kind of negative thing. But again, it wasn't all that unusual in that time. You take an empire like Vijayanagara. Vijayanagara doesn't collapse because a bunch of enemies come and you know, they, they wage battle and destroy it. It collapses from within. There are governors who are within, who sort of eat away at the vitality of the state from within, and power gets sort of dispersed among subordinate levels. So by the end of it, the last Vijayanagara emperor is an emperor without a kingdom. He has nowhere to go. He's living off the largesse of other people. The Bahmani Sultanate is similar, you know, they, they have a Bahmani Sultan. And the last one of them is in such a pitiable condition, he just gets on a ship to Mecca and disappears from history, quite literally, sails off from the scene. And it's successor states that continue to rule there. Hyder Ali does something similar. He, he becomes, he topples the Dalavoys, takes over the position in Mysore, but he doesn't topple the Vadiyas. He maintains them as a kind of figurehead. It's Tipu who much later decides that, okay, I don't think we need a Vadiyar. So I think when the king dies in 1796, Tipu doesn't replace him. He doesn't bother with the, with the outer form of bringing in a Vardiyar and putting him on the throne and paying a kind of public homage to him. So there's, you know, the, the pattern therefore isn't all that unusual when it comes to Tipu and Haida. Right, so that paints a very interesting picture actually of how power worked in, in South India. I have to say uh, some of this in researching the exhibition has been new to me. I mean, the, the 18th century as a period is very much a comfort zone for me, but I'm usually north of the Indias, and in fact, you know, in, in Rajasthan or somewhere. And there, it, would you make a, would you agree that there's a, a, a distinction to be made there? I mean, the Rajput kingdoms that I've looked at often claim ancestry and, 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 and a kind of existential reality going back sometimes to the eighth century or beyond, um, as if they're, they're literally set in stone. I mean, they write their own histories in, 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 in stone, although that may be an exaggeration. Of course, there were yeah. um, shifting power allegiances and, and fragmentations of, of, of Rajput kingdoms and changing relations with central authorities, with the late Mughals and so on. Um, there is a much greater sense of, of, of distinct identities, of continuities. Of, continuity, of continuities, yes. Do you think that's a fair comparison between North and, and, and South? Again, I would hesitate to make a categorical statement on that ground because you know, the continuity, genealogy, descent, an unbroken line of descent, these things are sometimes overrated. In reality, you know, you do have cases among Rajput, I'm not naming anyone because people take offense these days, mm -hmm. but there are kingdoms where, let's say, the, the, king, the kingdom is attacked by a foreign invading force, the heir to the throne is rescued and taken off deep into the forest, then re-emerges many years later. You see something, now, you have no guarantee this is the same person. 
you have no guarantee that this is actually from the same royal family or of the same lineage. And this happens in the South, for example, as late as the 18, late 1820s, there was a guy who just happened to find the heirlooms and the possessions of the last kings of Bednor, which Hyderly destroyed that kingdom and, and annexed it. And he just picks them up and says, oh, I'm the heir and descendant of this royal family. He was nobody. He was somebody who had gone to prison, happened to meet a holy man who had these heirlooms with him, appropriated it for himself, and claimed to be descended from the original line. There are a lot of royal families in India across the subcontinent who claimed descent in, let's say, somewhat mysterious ways. Uh, Tarabai, the, the Maratha queen, for example, she, she, she had a son. The son died relatively young. There was no known grandchildren that she had. And she was, she was put away for about 35 years. She wasn't on the scene. She was essentially eclipsed and removed. But then, it, around the mid-18th uh, mid no, mid century, there was a moment where there wasn't a, a, an heir to the throne. And she said, oh, you know, I had a grandson I secretly hid away. And then she resurrects this boy and brings him on and puts him on the throne. Doesn't prove to be very obedient to her. He's actually got a mind of his own, doesn't listen to her. He's not a puppet. At which point she says, oh, he was just a bard I picked off the streets. He's not somebody you know, who's related to me or my son in any way. So the point is that genealogy was one way of claiming legitimacy. Another was access to God. Another was access to um, you know, some kind of spiritual legacy. Some Sufi saint comes and sort of gives you that legitimacy. Access to foreign powers. The Deccan Sultans got a lot of their legitimacy from the Shah of Iran, not from the Mughals. And it was convenient because the Shah of Iran was far away. He wasn't going to come and breathe down their backs, and therefore, perfect person to borrow legitimacy from. So again, in the North, the stories are a lot more compact, well done. And we don't know of any dramatic breaks, perhaps, as happened often in the South. But again, I wouldn't overstate the argument. Yeah. But did the, uh, the local nobility, the aristocracy, also play a role in those processes of legitimization? Again, as you were speaking, what came to mind that in the North, um, what often happens is, not often, but you occasionally have, say, a posthumous son. And the question indeed is, what, how can we believe in this? I mean, what veracity is there here? And a lot depends upon the takos, on the nobles of the court, saying, well, well you know, we are the clan leaders, we accept this child, or we accept the statement of the child's mother exactly. um, that, that, that is the son of the, of the, of the late Maharaja. And, and that's enough. It's not then you have to kind of do a DNA test, supposing, you know. And, you know and in a sense, it was a way of ensuring that the best fitted cat candidate made it to the throne. We mm. assume that the emphasis on having a pristine bloodline meant that anybody could, you know, simply by the accident of birth, end up on the throne. But why did succession struggles take place? Why did cadet branches come and take power? Why did younger sons triumph over older sons? In a sense, it was survival of the fittest. It was whoever was best suited to the throne, best able to bring the court together, all the factions, all the groups, that was the right person to actually sit on the throne, even if, formally speaking, legitimacy might be questionable. It isn't all that unusual. The Adil Shah Sultanate of Bijapur, uh, the first Adil Shah's wife, she's a Maratha lady, she had a grandson who wasn't up to the mark. She popped him off and put an illegitimate grandson on the throne because he was the right person Fitter. for the position. Mm -hmm. But this whole business of posthumous children, uh, as late as the 19th century, in the 1880s, there was a, a British bureaucrat, his name evades me at the moment. But he spoke about how in a lot of Indian states, every time a Raja died without heirs, and he'd never had any children that anybody knew about, suddenly the widows would be pregnant. And there'd be competing pregnancies in the palace, and then there'd be a fight over who, would, who was the legitimate son. And this happened in the kingdom of Baroda, when Khandi Rao Gaikwad passed away in 1870. And his widow, who had never had a child till then, he had, he had two other wives, he'd never had children by then, she declared herself pregnant. And you know, the British are always a bit suspicious of these convenient pregnancies just at the moment of the, of the succession. But it was again a political process by which the succession was delayed. It created at least a nine month gap, or at least six months, depending on where you were in this pregnancy. Uh, it allowed factions at court to realign. It allowed everybody look at, to look at what was happening elsewhere with the British, with the other imperial powers you're dealing with, and then come to an arrangement that fits everybody's needs and therefore serves the interests of the throne as an entity that represents everybody else. So having produced this picture then of, of, of the way in which power is asserted and passed on in, in South India, tell us how the British fit into this story. The British and the French in particular insert themselves into this complex pattern from the middle of the 18th century onwards. Because obviously it's not a, a terrain that they're going to be familiar um, with. How do, how do they negotiate it? And 
as begin to intervene. In our standard history books, we tend to learn of the Battle of Plassey as the big moment when the empire began. You know, that's when the East India Company actually starts governing territory, large chunk of territory. And then they start, they have this expansion that ends with the fall of the Sikh Empire nearly a century later. And that's how the Raj comes into the picture a few years after that. Now, but in reality, the, the French and the British were quite familiar with South India. In, in Kerala, for example, they were there from the 1690s. Uh, a queen in Travancore had given them a little place, you know, a place called Anjatenga. She'd given them a few acres over there, and they had a little post in, in Kerala for a long time. In Madras, they were actually deciding where the temple should be built, what, how caste disputes should be resolved. They were doing, their soldiers were leading processions of Hindu gods. Because they were traders, they were not yet politically powerful to hold their own, and therefore their incentive was to try and mix into local society and maintain a balance with local traditions, local culture, etc. There was a kind of accommodation that took place with the with these uh, with the French and the and the British. What happens is that you know slowly they start in, in South India they start meddling in the Arcot succession and that's how they both the French and the British they back rival parties. So the Nawab dies, there are two claimants, one company backs one party, the other company backs the other. That's where they start outsourcing or giving giving their my apologies. That's where they start giving their armies out on loan, on hire to Indian powers, and start getting entangled in local political affairs. They're still not necessarily conquering large swathes of land as they did in Bengal, but they're still becoming a political presence in South India. And I mean, initially, I think there were overtures they made to Hyder Ali as well. It wasn't like they saw him right from the start as some kind of fierce antagonist. It was only later that uh, relationship soured. So they were increasingly present there. The French, in fact, that's the big underestimated story in India, right? We assume that the British Empire happened and therefore that was the only thing that could have happened. But you do, I mean, you know, of course, that Madras was taken over by the French in the middle of the, of the 18th century. There were political dynamics in Europe. A peace settlement in Europe is what led to Madras being returned to the English East India Company. For all you know, if the French had triumphed, we'd be having this conversation in French, not in English. You know, that could have happened in, in, in India. As late as the early 19th century, Sindhya and Gwalior, his, his, he had freelance French uh, warriors and, and, and mercenaries helping train his armies. In 1795, when the British signed a subsidiary alliance tre treaty with the Maharaja of Travancore, they discovered that he's got French uh, men actually training his troops. So the French presence is always there. It was a bit understated because, again, we're fixated on the British story, so we don't necessarily focus on how much of a part the French played. But they were there till quite late in the day. Yeah, I agree with you. The French are, are, are written out um, of the story retrospectively um, because it's classically the victors who tell the, the, the story. Um, so let, you've mentioned a number of things, and let's, let's unpack some of those in a bit more detail. One is the, the, the rivalry between the, the, the France and Britain in Europe and the way in which that is really the backdrop for a rivalry that's played out in, in South India, but also the way in which that... European rivalry in, in the peninsula then plays into uh, against and alongside the regional powers. And you also mentioned the shifting dynamic of the Mysore Wars, that things weren't, you know, it, it, it wasn't obvious in 1760 that we were going to lead to this yes, event in 1799. Yes. This was, you know, very, very far. So let's, let's, just, let's just go through the, 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 the sequence of the wars, as it were. So Heda Ali in the 1760s is expanding his territory. This brings him up against the, all of the other regional powers, um, including, obviously, the, the, the British. And my sense is that originally, in the first Mysore War, which is in, within the 1760s, which ends in a Treaty of Madras, which is a treaty of, of mutual support, a treaty as a treaty should be, which, as it were, promises, each side promises to support the other against alien invasion. There's a total return of captives which of course later becomes a, a big issue, a return of conquered territories. So you're returning to the status quo, antebellum as it were, with a proper uh, treaty of mutual support. That looks to me not like antagonism, that looks to me like containment. Yeah. Is that how you would see that early phase? I think so, and also there's a reason why all of these paintings ultimately depict events around 1799 or 1798, the late 1790s. Because the early engagements, either the British lost or there was nothing to celebrate as such. You know, the whole yeah. celebration, why is all this commemorated in art? Because here the East India Company had a triumph. There was a consciously, there was an, there was an awareness that this was a great moment and therefore it, there, was, there was need for propaganda 
to sort of celebrate all of that. But as you said, the earlier engagements were different. Uh, the, the, the Battle of Pololor in 1780, if I'm not mistaken, it left them highly embarrassed. In fact, it was Tipu who commissioned art celebrating that, propaganda art of his own. If you go to his palace in Sri Rangapatna, you'll see this huge mural painting on the wall. And it's quite fascinating, very bloody. For every uh, missing head, you'll find a corresponding body in some other corner of the painting. Arms are missing, all of that is happening. And the English colonel, Bailey, I think his name was, is shown seated in a palanquin, the sign of effeminacy in that particular context. And he's chewing his nails. And you, I think you've got a picture in the book. Whereas Tipu is seated on this oversized horse, smelling a flower, because you know he's victorious. So this is Tipu's self-image because he's defeated what he sees as a major enemy. And he therefore has an incentive to commemorate that in art. Because for him, that's a big moment. Whereas for these chaps, it was after Tipu was defeated that they produced all of this. Because they needed their propaganda at that particular moment. Yeah. And before that, as you said, there was accommodation, there was containment. So neither side was fully, they were sort of looking at each other, gauging where this was headed. But there was nothing decisive, perhaps, to celebrate. So yes, I should explain to the audience, and particularly if you haven't seen the exhibition, um, that while the purpose of a discussion like this is to, uh, to flesh out some of the historical detail, to give a fuller account of the historical um, events around the Mysore Wars, it's certainly not the intention of the exhibition to give a full and complete depiction of the Mysore Wars, and, or, or indeed a fair and unbiased account of Tipu Sultan. What this exhibition presents you with is a British perspective on Tipu Sultan around 1800. It's highly partial, um, and so the, but it, the, the point of the exhibition, as it were, is therefore not historical fullness or accuracy, but to show you, as it were, one particular uh, perspective. And yes, it's important, as, as, as Manu says, that the, there's, this, there's this turning point in the middle, that the first Mysore War ends in a sort of mutual um, reciprocal aid in containment of the problem. The second one ends in a complete disaster uh, for the British uh, with the B Battle of Polilur, which, as he as says, is, is represented um, on, the, on the walls uh, of, of, the, of the palace in the, the Darya Dalit Bagh in Sharangapatna, an enormous mural commissioned by uh, Tipu Sultan. Now, I would have loved, as it were, to have put, juxtaposed the later British views, the, 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 the triumphalist depiction of 1799 with Polilur, but short of dragging a historic building you know, from Delhi. the Calvary to Delhi, um, I couldn't do that. What we have done is we've got a, a major essay in the book on those murals by Savita Kamari, and indeed it's got a number of both large images and details, including the one that Manu just mentioned, the, the hapless Colonel Bailey, who's found himself completely surrounded by Tipu, it's both Haida and Tipu on the field at this point. So Haida is still alive, it's two years before his death, but, but um, the, the 30 year old um, Tipu is already very actively engaged, helping his father on the field, and surrounds um, Bailey's forces, and he's shown seating his, um, uh, seating his palanquin in a gesture which I think Mughal art historians would describe as biting the finger of astonishment and dismay. I think is the, is, is the phrase that's used for that particular. So poor old Bailey is then incarcerated in, Saranga, uh, in, the, in the dungeons of Shurangapatna, um, along with uh, Colonel Baird. Bailey dies there. Baird is eventually released. So then we move on to the next two wars. There's then, there's then a gap um, until Cornwallis um, arrives as go governor general in the late 1780s, and by 1790, he's planning his campaign. This is the third Mysore War, which very rapidly, I mean, it involves the, first of all, the capture of a lot of the hill forts that Heda and Tipu had used in the Baramahal region, for example, then the capture of Bangalore, the city of Bangalore, and then he twice besieges Shirangapatna, and although he doesn't um, overrun it, he does, he is able to force a very unequal um, treaty on Tipu, which involves T Tipu ceding half of his territory, paying an enormous indemnity of some three crores, and the surrender of two of his sons um, as, as, as hostages. So let's just pause there, and I want to ask you how much you think um, has changed then ideologically. How much is it about the personality of someone like Cornwallis? How much is it about changing allegiances, including with the French, the reliance on French military technology? What is it that's changed so much to, to lead us to the events of 90 to 92 as against the earlier 
earlier episodes? I would highlight Cornwallis here because, you know, if you look at the, the broader history of the East India Company, by the 1770s, there's greater parliamentary scrutiny. By the 1780s, Parliament is really sort of breathing down the company's back to make sure they don't get entangled in further wars and expensive affairs in India because it's, it's counterproductive. The profits are being leached away in the name of wars. Now, the important thing is, as William Dalrymple has shown, soldiers on the ground had an incentive for war because you had offered opportunity to loot, you had opportunity to plunder, you could make a lot of money that you wouldn't make with your regular salary. Cornwallis, if I'm not mistaken, had had an embarrassing defeat in America a few years before. And this was a man who came to India seeking glory. So though his bosses said, look, you're not here to fight, you're not here to pick uh, you know, battles with, with uh, local Indian native princes, Cornwallis did the exact opposite. Because he was looking for glory, he wanted to do something sensational, given the kind of embarrassment he had faced on the, on the other side of the world. So this is why I think personalities and their motivations come in, because clearly it wasn't official policy. It was one man's uh, motivation and drive that was pushing some of this to start with. Of course, there was the other thing, which was that Tipu went to war with the Maharaja of Travancore. And the big fear was if Tipu managed to get the Travancore coast, which is South Kerala, that means the entire coastline, half of the west coast is in his hands, which gives him access to the sea and access to the French. And the French aren't very far away either. They're, they're a day or two's uh, sailing away. So there was a bit of fear about that, and that's when Cornwallis joins the, the, the military operations. His successor is again a bit of a pacifist, John Shaw, if I'm not mistaken. And John Shaw doesn't want wars again, so Tipu is left in peace. And Tipu, in fact, uses that time to regain some of his strength. He starts corresponding with the French even more, and even though the French are now revolutionary fronts, and that's a bit of a problem for people on the, on the other side as well, because if you look at a lot of literature produced in England in this time, there's abhorrence about what's happening in France. How can you behead a king? Kings are divine. And the French have just done something that nobody can believe is possible. It is barbaric, even by, even by the standards Europeans set uh, themselves. So there's that. And then, of course, Lord Wellesley comes. And Lord Wellesley is, again, a confirmed imperialist. In fact, I believe Lord Wellesley's career would have ended in official censure from London because he was, again, expanding the empire despite very clear instructions not to do it. But Wellesley was, again, completely Francophobe. He hated the French, he hated French influence, and he wanted glory. If you, if you look at his collected works, he actually writes somewhere that the greatest blessing that could be given to India is domination by the British. I mean, I'm paraphrasing, but something along these lines. So again, you have a personality here who's looking, who's itching for some kind of contest. And Tipu Sultan gives him something of an excuse uh, simply by having links with the French. And he decides, OK, we're going to uh, sweep in and take over the rest of Mysore as well. So I think these two, the, the, the third and the fourth Anglo-Mysore wars, in great measure were driven by the men at the helm. Uh, even though there were wider processes, other things happening, I think what ultimately tilted things is the personality of the men on the British side. They were men who were looking for glory and greatness, and to them that came from building an empire. Mm. So it's worth just pointing out, for example, just detail, but how did they get away with it um, if Cornwallis, as Manu says, was sent out with specific instructions not to wage war? Um, and he arrives and he does precisely that. What you need to um, r recall is that for, for news, for any communication to be sent from London to Madras took at least four months. It's going by sea. And in fact, we have in a, in a cabinet in the back of the, the gallery um, some of the newspapers which give the first reports in England of the siege of Srinagar, which happened in May 1799, and they're dated uh, four months later. Um, so, it, 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 because you're on the ground, because you're, you know, by the time news gets back to England and what you're doing, it's just too late to, to do anything. And the men on the ground were capable of manipulating this. I know this from my studies on Travancore. There was this, the, the Raja had been forced to sign a treaty in 1805. He kept issuing letters to Bengal saying, I'm not happy with this, I'm being forced to do this by your local resident in my court. The Bengal authorities simply didn't send this to London. So by the time London found out the Raja was an unwilling party to this transaction, it was five years later. It took five yeah. years for them to discover that the Raja was bombarding Bengal with petitions against the treaty, simply because Bengal wouldn't forward the correspondence. And this kind of dissimulation happened a lot in that period because of this gap and the lag in, in, in communications reaching uh, you know, the different ends of this enterprise. Yeah. So going back to the personalities, yes, Cornwallis, as you rightly say, he's a military leader. I mean, he's appointed Governor General, but he's very much a, yeah. a, the soldier. 
um, who arrives and is, is looking, as you say, to redeem his reputation after his humili humiliation at the, the hands of the American revolutionaries. And he sees a nice little war um, that he can, and, and does very well in it, it has to be said. I mean, the Third Mysore War goes well for, for, for Corn Cornwallis. Um, John Shaw, the intermediary, is essentially f for quietening things down. Not, not that everybody's, everybody's heaving a sigh of relief. Indeed, he was criticized precisely for allowing Tipu to, to recoup his, his, regather his strength and so on. Richard Wells is less the soldier, though he is, as you rightly say, the imperialist. Actually, it's his younger brother, who was actually there at the end. Who was there, yes. his younger brother, Arthur Wellesley, who's present at the final siege in 1799, and who retrospectively, as much, much later, the British public imagination gives him a lot of the credit, quite unduly, because this um, Arthur Wellesley is the Duke of Wellington. He's the man who defeats Napoleon. He's, you know, the, the greatest hero in British military so history. myth-making that happens. Yeah, I mean, he's, he's, he's not this, this huge figure at this point. He's just a young officer, but he becomes this great figure. Um, and, and by the mid-19th century, um, the, the siege of Shurangapatna is associated more with him than with General Baird, who actually led the, the yeah. charge, and yeah, well, they were both there, but who led, who, 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 who led the charge. Um, so yes, that's part of the kind of... Uh, but but the, the, the other thing that's changed, I think, is the perception of the French. And you mentioned this idea of um, the, the, the move from simply acquiring modern European military technology from the French to repair your, your fort, to restructure your armed forces, to equip your artillery. That's one thing. But it's another thing to see that there's an alliance with this feared and detested revolutionary ideology. And I think that's the trigger for Wellesley, isn't it? That he, well, the excuse he uses, at least, is the uncovering of secret communications between, between yes. Tipu and, and, and revolutionary yep. France. And it's difficult, as it were, because we take the values, we, we, you know, the, the, the cutting off of the king's head is one thing. A, a, a reflective Britain hmm. might have thought, well, we did that a hundred years ago, but we sort of stuck it back on again. No, it was so, a you know, principle we, also. I think yes. republicanism in general was a bit of a, a, a taboo. I mean, a lot of people it's terrifying for people precisely in positions, aristocrats yeah. like Wellesley and, and Cornwallis. And it's in fact, that's, that's the threatened. thing, right? Wellesley was also an aristocrat. And this is also where you see the East India Company slowly turning from a mercantile venture that happened to also have territory it used in service of its larger mercantile activities into something that is consciously an empire. I think Wellesley is among the first to use the word our Indian empire because he's aware that he's building something that will last the ages. And he's the hero of this particular story. So there is that aristocratic element also coming into this. Do you think, that, are there any other comparisons of, of an Indian state that is so closely in touch with a foreign power on the ideological level that, that, that you, know, you look at the neighbors, they, they might be large and powerful like Hyderabad, um, but this, this notion that, that a, a regional power dares to look outside of the South Asian boundaries and to ally itself, align itself with revolutionary France. So that's something new in, in subcontinental history, isn't you it? Know, I, I hesitate to place too much premium on that, partly because I think retrospectively when we look back, we see that the British became this huge thing and Europe became this huge thing. So how dare a native power have the, 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 the audacity to deal with Europeans on equal terms and sort of construct some kind of a, an exchange there. But I think for Tipu, it came as a very natural thing because of what was happening in the way military development took place in India, especially in the second half of the 18th century. The scholarly term for it is military fiscalism because earlier you had kings who had chieftains and subordinates. They maintained little militias and every time the king needed them, he would call them, summon them and an army would show up, all these people coming together. So it was outsourced. You were given jagirs and they maintained the jagirs and so on. If you look at Tipu's state, like a few other states in the same period, Travancore being one example, there was a centralization taking place. There was a removal of chiefly powers and the creation of a bureaucracy to operate the state. So you have hired appointed officers running your state, not hereditary chieftains. So that centralization was also feeding one thing, a standing army. So the king isn't dependent on chieftains who could switch at any moment to a rival power, as often happened. That's why I said boundaries were not very clear in the early modern age, for example, because your, your frontier chieftains could keep switching sides all the time. So Tipu was constructing a centralized state, a more bureaucratized state, and therefore needed a standing army. Now, a standing army guzzles a lot of money. 
Now, the, the standing army needs technology of the latest type. So his economic strategies, his military strategies were all about maintaining that kind of power because that is the only way he could take on the East India Company because East India Company had a standing army. In fact, they were getting into these subsidiary alliances with a lot of princes, I mean, largely in a, in a later period also, where other princes were subsidizing these armies, right? So they mm -hmm. were getting to maintain large armies at the expense of a bunch of Indian Rajas who were paying them tribute and that allowed for these armies to be maintained. So Tipu was, I suppose, structurally following a format that was very familiar to Europeans and therefore Europeans saw danger in that because they could be beaten on their own terms, you know, on a, on a turf that they thought was specific to them, but was emerging slowly in India also, uh, military fiscalism, and Tipu seemed to master it and come very close to perfecting it. So let's talk a bit about how that all was perceived back in Britain, which is, as it were, the prelude to the creation of these paintings and, and prints around us. Because there's an extent, I think, to which Tipu, particularly after 1780, after Polilor, is kind of built up in the public imagination as this terrifying figure, as this great threat to, to British interests. One of the things that fuels that are the so-called prison narratives, and one of my colleagues has written about these in the, in, in the catalogue. These are narratives written by British officers who had been uh, captured, and soldiers who had been captured and arrested and held in prison by first Heda and then by, by, by Tipu. And if they're lucky enough to be released, they write these grueling accounts, these very kind of overblown accounts of how terribly badly treated they were, how they were tortured and, and, and so on. And this, this helps to fuel this, this, this idea that, um, that, that the Tipu is this kind of monster, um, that, that therefore justifying the action against us. Um, have you f f investigated that much at all? Have you looked at the sort of perception of, of, of Tipu in, within Britain in the, in, the, in the period before the siege? You know, two things really. On the, on the one hand, the way Tipu is depicted in these paintings, for example, if you look at the broader stretch of how this kind of art is done, it's not surprising. You know, I, I'll give you the example. There's a famous painting of Jahangir, the Mughal emperor, embracing Shah Abbas. And they're standing on top of a globe, and, Shah, uh, and Jahangir is standing on a lion, and this one's got the goat or whatever, uh, representing Persia. And it's fascinating because Jahangir is clearly the bigger man. Uh, the Shah Abbas is in a slightly supplicant position. The, lambs, the lamb and the lion are both asleep, but the lion's head is nudging the lamp away from India, to look away from India. It's political messaging. Jahangir also commissions a, a famous painting where he's shooting an arrow at the impaled head of Malik Ambar, the African general who for 25 years prevented Mughal expansion into the Deccan. He never actually achieved that. Malik Ambar died very comfortable in his bed at the age of 80-something. But Jahangir yeah. created propaganda art to, to depict something he never actually succeeded in achieving. Now you can say it was motivation for himself that this is an enemy I want to defeat, or perhaps not. So this kind of art was always created to sort of other the enemy, to sort of make the enemy look like some kind of fearsome figure, and you had to justify why you were dealing with the enemy in that, in that way. Now what's happening in the late 18th century and early 19th century in England also is a creation of the British identity. And that also, and look, there are MPs invested in the East India Company. So they have an incentive in whatever the East India Company does. They're not merely dispassionate parties looking at this company. They're involved in it very much, and they have financial incentives. There are, some, there are aristocrats who want glory and greatness in foreign lands and to come back as heroes, often with a lot of treasure that allows you to buy parliamentary seats, uh, you know, create, as they say, teen generations ki jayadat or whatever in Hindi. And, you know, all of that, those motivations are there. But there's also creation of an identity in British society. This is also the time missionaries are starting to ask to come to India. And therefore, othering the Indian, othering the Indian political power, making them look particularly bad, particularly barbaric, particularly ruthless, is a form of justifying not only action, including violent action, cruel action, greed, when you boil it down, but it's also a way of giving yourself the feeling that, oh, we're doing something that is morally just. We're also, I mean, Wellesley claiming that the British Empire would be the best blessing for India is him couching his ambitions and his activities in some kind of a moral argument. So I think that broader trend Again, Tipu fits into that very nicely because he becomes the focus of a lot of this kind of propaganda. He becomes the face to what the British at that time were looking for to justify their growth in India and their various somewhat controversial activities in yeah. India. Frankly, if it wasn't Tipu, they would have found some other face. It's always the case. You know, Tipu happened to be there. He happened to give them a fight. And therefore, I suppose he became what he is to all of us today. But if it weren't for Tipu, they would have found some other face, perhaps, 
to give that, that dynamic. That's an interesting thought. So let's come to the pictures then for a bit, and particularly the two that are within sight of the audience, the, um, the, the large oil by Henry Singleton, um, entitled The Last Effort and Fall of Tipu Sultan, showing a sinking Tipu, Tipu already half fallen with his turban knocked off his head, sinking under the onrush of redcoats. Um, and that, by, say by Henry Singleton, um, that's the, the original oil painting, um, dissem shown at the Royal Academy, uh, but also disseminated widely as a print. We've got one print here, which where interestingly the, the, the caption is bilingual, it's in, it's in English and French. So he obviously knows who his audience is going to be. Um, it's not in English and Canada or English and Persian, it's in English and French. Um, and then this, which is the printed version because the original painting is lost, uh, by Robert Carr Porter, um, showing the siege, uh, the, the, the day of the siege, 4th of May, uh, 1799, with Bailey leading the, 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 the company forces over the walls and a yellow-clad tipu um, by the Jaroka uh, looking on uh, in dismay. Um, the important thing I think to, that I want, would like to communicate about these two works is, well, first of all, their theatricality. And in the case of this one, almost literally so, the original painting on which this very large print was based was even larger, very considerably larger. It was 120 feet long. There was no way in which he was going to be able to display that in the Royal Academy. He hired a theatre in central London, the Lyceum, and constructed a semicircular um, mount and mounted his enormous canvas, which he painted in six weeks um, on this thing and charged a shilling. Uh, for entry. So it, it's a commercial opportunism. It's feeding off this kind of public frenzy. The news might be four months old, but it's new on the streets of London, and he dashes off this, this, this wonderful, you know, dramatic painting. And he did so without ever going to Sri Rangapatna. Neither Singleton nor Karporta ever went to India. They're basing these images entirely on written accounts, which were, again, written on the spot immediately afterwards by participating officers, very, very popular um, publications, and they're, they're sort of capitalizing um, on this. And it, it doesn't matter to them um, that, you know, it may not be very authentic, um, but Carporter is helped very successfully, very considerably by the fact that Lord Harris, who was one of the senior participating generals, visited the Lyceum, saw it in London, and said, yes, that's exactly how it happened. It was just like that. I was there. And so everybody believes it, and the, the, the print becomes very popular. But the point is that these were two young artists who were making their name, make, taking the opportunity out of this great moment of um, public interest. So the question is, what do they mean to you now? How do you respond to these? I mean, I'm, I'm as it were, as an art historian, interested in how the British saw them at the time. I mean, obviously seeing them as, th th there were one or two dissenting voices, I should say, just for balance. You know, because they're, they're early as action paintings of depictions of war, there were people who thought this was incredibly vulgar. Um, the poet Goethe thought the very idea of a panorama was vulgar. Um, Henry Fuseli, who was a Swiss artist, of Swiss origin, but a naturalized British artist, said, but it has no literary content. How can it be art if there, if there is no literary content? Um, so the, the, there was a view, a very highbrow view that this was, but for the most part, everybody thought this was tremendously exciting and a, and a great kind of celebration of the triumph of, of British arms. How do you respond to it now? Well, these were clearly made for mass appeal, right? In fact, when you mentioned how they weren't here, they had to sort of imagine things, it's that picture that came to my mind because that's, that's I think, Tipu's kids uh, leaving the palace with, and these are the mothers and the ladies who sort of, uh, seeing them off. And if you look at them, they're very European. These aren't Indian women by any stretch. Even like the body language, the color, all of that is very European. And this is, it reminds me of a lot of art. Uh, I think one of the earliest paintings done of an Indian Devadasi, or Devadasi's plural, was somewhere in the 14th century by someone called the Parisian painter. I don't know his name, but that's, I think, the tag that's given to him. He had never seen a Devadasi. He had read about Devadasis in temples, and he decided to draw them. And what he basically ended up doing is, having a bunch of women dressed like nuns, dancing around another figure in the center, which was supposed to be the idol, but also dressed like a sister. And that's his Devadasi. You know, so it, it's European eyes that haven't actually seen it, but there is appetite, there is a desire to sort of put this out there. So you apply what is familiar, take the story, and try and create a mash there. 
And you know, the use of the word vulgar is fascinating, right? Because vulgar doesn't necessarily mean bad or as we, as we colloquially use it. It means popular, yeah. mass. You're feeding into something that people crave or they want. It's a bit like masala, you know. It's not, it's not highbrow art, it is cheap art in a sense. You know, you're trying to sort of cater to a larger audience, cater to the public mood. You're not achieving something that, is, that transcends uh, the here and now. So I suppose that's the word they were using. For historians, this is all wonderful evidence again. You know, the very question of why is there so much art around the final anglo mysore war and nothing, very little commemorating anything before that. The, the why gives you interesting answers, which is that Tipu's defeat is what mattered. Tipu's triumphs are not something the British are going to celebrate. Why are they, why are they made this way? Who are the artists that were doing this? As you said, these are young artists keen to make a name for themselves. They sense that this is the pulse. This is what will get us noticed. Therefore, let's make dramatic uh, productions of it. And this is all drama. This is all ultimately extremely yeah. theatrical. And it's meant, therefore, to, you know, at one level, I suppose, even titillate the, yeah. the audience Ooh. at that time. So if we go back to the one you mentioned, this is actually by an American artist resident in London called May the Brown. And although American, his, his sympathies are very much with, with the, the British, his British audience. And there is no written account, whereas um, at least Carl Porter could rely on written accounts of the siege. Nobody mentions the sons who were in 1792 become the hostages. Nobody mentions them saying goodbye to their mothers. He just supposes that it must have happened and therefore we can reconstruct this scene. And again, May the Brown never went to India, never met an Indian woman or saw what Indian dress looked like. But I think also you have to recall that in this period, this is where around 1800, it's a period, in spite of 200 years of the company, it's still a period of extraordinary visual illiteracy with regard to India on the part of the British. Thomas and William Daniel are beginning to produce, um, ac publish aquatine yeah. views of the landscapes of the buildings, which give people an insight into what India looks like topographically. Um, but there are still few images. Um, and so he can get, May the Brown can get away with representing the women, uh, never mind just the details of what they look like, their skin tones and their dress, the very idea that this is an authentic Zanana scene with the women coming out of the front door of the Zanana under the full glare of the yeah, Mahouts <laughs> sitting on the elephants. I mean, he, he had been told, of course, the boys were transported to Cornwallis's camp. The, the interesting thing, to, I think, to me about May the Brown, perhaps even more than these, these two, is his, his focus on this moment of great emotion. And this is coming out, actually, of an earlier tradition of European history painting, which is less about violence and more about um, virtue and, and moral matters. And so I think he thought that this would be an affecting scene um, more than the... It, it, it doesn't show... He doesn't show Cornwallis's siege that led up to this moment. He shows the consequence of the siege, which is the surrender of the boys. And I think Singleton perhaps realized that he'd missed a trick because his response is to do, and it's on the wall over here, a picture of the boys saying goodbye to their father. Um, and then he follows that up with, with, the, with the, follow, the, 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 the family mourning the body. And that one is particularly interesting because it, it's a very classical, neoclassical idiom. Yes. Tipu is at last shown very much as a, a, a painter, a British painter or French painter of that period, might have shown a great hero of the Trojan Wars. And so the kind of the subliminal message there is, well, now that he's dead, we can afford him some kind of dignity. We can say, well, he's, he's comparable to Hector. He's a worthy enemy. He's a worthy yeah. enemy. But he's also a dead one, yeah. which is very, very, <laughs> very reassuring. And that sort of looks forward, I think, to th that picture reminds me of a, of, a, of a comment made a century after it was made by Lord Curzon. When Curzon is mooting the establishment of the Victoria Memorial, Hall in Calcutta and of course he's seeking financial contributions from Indian princes and he says well it's going to be a history lesson uh, it's going to tell the story of, of the great British possession of India and so of course we'll, we'll have Indians in there as well um, and it won't just be portraits of Brits you know we'll have some some Indian portraits and we'll particularly include even those who fought against us provided only that their record was not sullied by crime mm -hmm. and then he mentions Tipu Sultan and he says, I know a very good picture of the death of Tipu Sultan. And you think on the one hand, well, we've, we, in one sense, we've come a long way from 100 years ago when he was the greatest villain. And now he's somebody who is not guilty of crime. But on the other hand, someone who, if we're seeking to educate the public, we'd better have a picture of him dead rather than a picture of him alive. It's still, 
important. So what's the legacy then of these pictures, do you think? I mean, in terms of a collective imagination. I mean, did, do, I, I noticed that there's a, there's a school book, um, a, a, a CBSE book, which has a, a picture of the surrender of Tipu's sons, the, the, the version by Robert Hume as its cover image. Um, well, this is the one where the, he's been, they're being received almost very warmly by yes. the British side. Yeah. So it's an extraordinary moment, actually, because the way in which it's told by the British, this, this, um, this what ought to be a rather horrifying event, two underage boys being used as hostages. I mean, they're aged five and eight. Um, they're, they're being used as hostages, but, but, but it, it, it's represented as a great act of benevolence by Cornwallis, that he's posing, he's putting himself in, the, in their position as their, their father, and that's how it's depicted. And it's also the East India Company assuming the right of benevolent parent, or benevolent patriarch of India. There's, there's something about it which is also about projecting the British as somehow having transcended all the violence, and now, you know, playing almost like a daddy role, you know. <laughs> You're a naughty child, but I'm still daddy, and therefore I will take care of you, even if I don't entirely like you. There's a kind of, you know, positioning in, in that painting as well, of how the British want to be seen. So I'm trying to position, as it were, this, this, this exhibition in terms of the impact it might have on a contemporary, that's a contemporary with us, um, Indian visual imagination, because you know, that painting, the singleton, is in India for the first time. It's one of only two or three important British history paintings in India at all. I mean, most pa paintings of that, that kind are in public collections in London. They're in the Indoor Office Library, they're in the National Army Museum, they're in the V&A. To have a, a history painting of that significance here um, is alone something special. And yet I feel that somehow this, particularly this image, is something that has been known in India. It's not often exhibited. Um, I'm trying to have it both ways, you understand. I'm both saying, but I'm both showing an Indian audience something you haven't seen before, but yet, but which I think has resonances or, or related images have a resonance. Is that, do you think, a. Very a much. In fact, it reminded me of, uh, when we spoke, I, I told you about this. I once uh, got a WhatsApp message uh, with this video, and it had the photograph of a man from Zanzibar, an African gentleman. And then the, the audio was all about how this is the real Tipu Sultan and look at the, what the leftist historians have taught us, which is this good looking, you know, the usual side profile picture of, of Tipu Sultan. He didn't look like this, this is Tipu's real face. The camera wasn't invented but Tipu was around. But people tend to digest these things. Whereas, you know, one advantage of an exhibition like this, even, I mean, despite the fact that this is British perspectives on Tipu, they're near contemporary artists. You know, some of the, 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 the faces that we see, the standard face, is what recurs in a lot of these paintings, which means they're all perhaps derived from a contemporary painting. People would have had contemporary portraits. I think you've got one on that wall, yeah. which belongs to his period. So we have, we have a number of portraits on that wall there. Do have a look at them. And, and um, the fact that there is a, a, a visual resemblance between the, the, the known yeah. um, portraits of Tipu Sultan suggests to me as an artist or in a common source and I think it probably was a court painting. The, the one, one of the ones that we have, although it's a British print made by um, Edward Orme, who was a member of a family of uh, very entrepreneurial artists and publishers in the early 19th century, it says that it's based on a painting that was in the possession of the Marquis Wellesley. Well, if Wellesley had a portrait of Tipu, that must have been by an Indian artist because no British artist had had access to Tipu. Um, and there's so, also some yeah. later Mysore Darbar paintings of Tipu because again, I, I believe in the Rang Mahal in, in Mysore, even though the Vardyars apparently you know, hated Tipu and they'd been kicked off the throne by Tipu and so on, Krishnaraja Vardya III, who the British put on the, on the throne as a five-year-old boy, when he was a little older and he started ruling a state, you know, some excuse or the other, there was a little rebellion and around 1830 the East India Company took over his state and they, they governed Mysore for about 50 years before handing it back to the Vardyars. And what's interesting is when this Raja commissions the Rang Mahal, he's got this wall, I believe, I've only seen photographs, but where he's got images of a lot of Indian kings. So Mughal emperors, local Hindu Rajas, Aurangzeb, and there's Tipu Sultan. But what's interesting is who's missing, and it's Queen Victoria. You know, even though he's doing this in the colonial period, he's obviously going to have English people visiting, or, or British representatives visiting that palace. He's still okay with having Tipu Sultan there, who his family didn't get along with, as far as we know, and yet he won't have Queen Victoria there, which means that, and again, it's the same face, it's the same profile and so on, which again shows that ultimately there was an acceptance of Tipu, even in, in the court that uh, he you know, was something of a villain to, 
but it was the British who, was, who were still the outsiders. So much for them being saviors and sort of resurrecting the Wadia dynasty, the Wadias did ultimately make their peace with Tipu Sultan. Thank you, Manu, very, very much for coming and unravelling so much of the complexities, not just of the history, but of the way it interacts with, um, with, with, with art in, in, in the period. Thank you all for coming, thank you. Um, and, and thank you, Manu.